Stephen Nachmanovich is the author of both Free Play and more recently The Art of Is. Yo-Yo Ma wrote that, quote, Stephen Nachmanovich's The Art of Is is a philosophical meditation on living, living fully, living in the present. To the author, an improvisation is a co-creation that arises out of listening and mutual attentiveness, out of a universal bond of sharing that connects all humanity. It is a product of the nervous system, bigger than the brain and bigger than the body. It is a once in a lifetime encounter, unprecedented and unrepeatable. Drawing from the wisdom of the ages, the art of is not only gives the reader an inside view of the states of mind that give rise to improvisation, it is also a celebration of the power of the human spirit, which, when exercised with love, immense patience and discipline, is an antidote to hate." Unquote. This was an amazingly inspiring conversation, extremely wide-ranging, including some musical improvisation. I've included timestamps to help listeners navigate the many topics we touched on, including many important artists. Good morning, Stephen Nachmanovich. Thank you so much for joining me. Good morning. It's my pleasure to be here. Many people will know you as an author, particularly of Free Play, which is a, an amazing book about improvisation in many forms, but mostly music. And more recently, you published The Art of Is, which I think is more about the importance of creativity in, in life in, in, in many different forms. Yeah. So we'll definitely dig in into your writing and your ideas and your performer. I'm going to play some music. And I was surprised to learn you were a computer software uh, engineer. And I was looking at your world music menu. I found that really interesting. Yes. Unfortunately, uh, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, um, the world music menu hasn't been updated in a long time. Mm. And the synthesizers that it worked with no longer exist. Oh. Um, so it can't be updated. But uh, I'd been fascinated by what you'd call the fundamentals of music, meaning going back to Pythagoras, whoever he or she was, mm -hmm. and um, the idea that, uh, that the perfect whole number ratios of string length or vibrating column or whatever are the basis of all the tones in all the cultures. And there's so many scales and so forth. And so the World Music Menu enabled you to just flick a button and uh, go to Bali or Japan or India or ancient Greece and play on a MIDI keyboard the scales of those cultures. Mm -hmm. And you've written about the importance of studying different music theories um, as a yeah. you know Western classically trained violinist. You know we just did the one type, but um, right. you yourself you studied Indian music for a while. I did. I studied Indian music for quite a while, and I. Mm -hmm. uh, have always adored it. Um, and that was actually um, perhaps more important than Western music in terms of how I introduced myself to the process of improvising. Um, my knowledge of Western music theory is actually relatively pathetic. I certainly know something about it, but um, uh, not as much as the average freshman in any music school. And, um, you know, there's so many music theories throughout the world and so many formats of musical culture and so many ways that sound can be put together. And really, when somebody asks me what kind of music I do, uh, I was stumped for decades. Uh, but now... I say that I play materialistic music. So we think of, uh, in our culture, we think of materialism as love of money. But what I'm interested in is, is the fact that, you know, you pick up a musical instrument and it's made of wood, it's made of metal, it's made of strings and gut and all the other things. And you're playing with the material. You know, if I'm just tapping on the table in front of me, I'm playing with the material of my fingers and the material of the wood of the table. And I'm really interested in the sounds that materials make. Yeah. And, and that's really it, yeah. Yeah. So you're holding um, an electric 
Is it a viol? It's like a six string violin, like a viola. Six string violin. Yeah, it's called a violetra. It's yeah. made by David Bruce Johnson in Birmingham, England. I'm going to be interviewing Tracy Silverman in a couple of weeks, actually. Oh, cool. So we'll talk about that. Great. But maybe you can just uh, talk about that instrument because you were one of the real pioneers in using electric violins, I believe. I, re I, I, um, when I started doing improvisation in the 1970s, mm -hmm. um, I was living in Berkeley, California, which was, of course, a hotbed of rock and roll. And um, my musical background was classical, uh, but I became fascinated very early with what could be done with an electric violin. And I went out and got one, and I went out to um, the music stores on Telegraph Avenue and started buying pedals, because it was fascinating to be able to modify the timbre of your sound electronically, rather than changing instruments and changing mm -hmm. instruments, and even though that's fun too. And I'm just really fascinated by the immense variety of violin family instruments uh, that you can play like this. I mean, I've got lots of them here. Um, but um, anyway, electric violin became a real staple for me and being able to play with loops and feedback and phasers and, you know, do things like, uh, you know, play through a phase shifter and echoes and all the things that you can do mm -hmm. are, was so fascinating to me. Uh, so that I've been doing that since the 70s. And since then, I've gone through a lot of electric instruments. This is really the best one that I've found so far. It's really mm -hmm. wonderful. Uh, this particular one Dave made for me, I got uh, one of his other instruments, which I really, really liked. I still have it, but it was kind of on the heavy side. So I wrote to him about making a one that was as light as an acoustic violin so that it could be played comfortably. And uh, I had a gig in Birmingham, England, so I went and visited him and we sat together and worked on the design a little bit and it was really great fun seeing the instrument appear a few months later. Yeah, I'd be really curious because, I mean, I had an electric violin for a while, but it was so heavy, so uncomfortable. Yeah. I just, yeah, didn't yeah. like it. Yeah, the weight is everything because a regular yeah. violin is a pound and a viola is a pound and a half. Mm -hmm. And that's about as much as, you know, if you play an instrument here, that's about as much as you want to do. So this is this is pretty close. It's slightly heavier than an electric than a regular violin. Yeah. Uh, but not very much, and um, so that made a lot of difference. But there's also there's a huge variety of electric instruments, mm -hmm. and a huge variety. Uh, I switched from pedals. Um, of course, with pedals you have to maintain cables and batteries, and uh, you know I was once. Uh, playing in a large theater in um, Granada in Spain mm -hmm. on a Sunday night where of course no stores were open and the battery had run out in one of my pedals and you know so anyway uh, I, I started doing uh, multi-effects boxes and in recent years of course in the last 10-15 years or so uh, there's so many effects built into computer software uh, so I basically just play through the laptop. Okay. Yeah, I was just, uh, the episode that actually came out today, I talked to Brendan Power recently. Do you know him? He's a harmonica player. Oh, no, I don't. Yeah, yeah he's a harmonica player and inventor, and he also likes to experiment with effects. So he was saying even for most people on the iPad, you can get all these free effects right. with any acoustic instrument, and right. he's saying you should check them out. I haven't done that yet. Absolutely. Um, yeah, you're mentioning, Stephen, like all the variety of, of uh, string instruments. Like I've been really exploring that in the series. So we had a Comancha player recently and I'll be interviewing Wonderful. a Gadulka, a, a Bulgarian player soon. But I noticed most of them, like Arhu and all these, they it's mostly the other way. I think it's more comfortable, right? Than the, the way the we play. Way. Yeah. Yeah, the cello yeah. way. Yeah. Virtually. Yeah, I also started in the, um, I still have it though. It's in a bad state of repair now. But in the 70s, uh, I got a Sarangi. Have you ever seen one of those? Maybe, but I can't. It's like a, it's like a you. It's like a, a mosque. 
It's a it's an Indian instrument with three. You play it like a baby cello in your lap. Mm -hmm. It has three main strings that you play on and thirty eight sympathetic strings. I have seen it. A pictures, yes. <laughs> and it's it's absolutely extraordinary. Yeah. And the whole business of sympathetic strings. I mean, in, in the West, uh, you know, we have uh, the viola d'amore. So this has got, uh, this is a fairly unusual one. It's got four main strings that you play exactly like a viola and five sympathetic strings underneath. Mm -hmm. And this was the result of the English and Dutch sailors traveling to India in the 16th, 14th, 15th, 16th centuries. I'm sorry, 15th, 16th mm -hmm. centuries. And um, bringing back sitars and sarangis and western makers became fascinated with sympathetic strings and so we got the viola d'amore and the baritone and all those sorts of things and what sympathetic strings really are is a way of creating electronic music before there were electronics yeah i the baritone you mentioned it's such an obscure instrument uh i remember a professor telling me that Haydn had written something like 80 baritone trios. He just loved yeah. this instrument that no one's heard of today. Right. Could you play a little bit on the viola d'amore for us? Sure. I mean, it's great that um, there's so much um, kind of second-rate Baroque music written for viola d'amore, but it's really best heard, like viola d'amore means viola of love, but it also means viola of the Moors, which was the okay. Europeans' generic name for all the brown-skinned people who lived to the south and east of them. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's also the love part of it also means that it's an instrument that's meant to be played close up to your lover because you can only hear the sympathetic strings really clearly when you're right next to them. So it's great to have the microphone right here. resonating. My very first um, episode uh, exactly a year ago was with uh, Kirsty Money, who's a nickel harpa player. Oh, you know cool. Who, it's all about the resonant yeah. um, strings. So we started talking about your life as a computer um, software programmer. I know you, um, you paid the bills for a while doing that. Oh, yes. Was it hard to balance all your creative work with having that job or could you make the hours work for you? Well, I did make the hours work. I mean, I was fortunate enough to have acquired computer skills back in the days of punch cards and COBOL and Fortran. Mm -hmm. uh, so in some ways it was like being a waiter or a waitress to support my work, but I could make much more per hour. So I didn't have to spend all my time working for money. Yeah. And that was really great. So yeah, I mean, it's hard to, I mean, uh, so-called work-life balance or whatever it is I call it sacred and secular mm -hmm. sacred work and secular work and in fact I have sacred desks and secular desks and have had for the last I guess 40 years um, so that's difficult but you know uh, no matter what your life situation uh, the plumbing breaks and you have to get that fixed and people get sick and you have to deal with that. And uh, you pay your taxes and you have to pay your rent and so forth. So every human being who's interested in something, whether it's music or poetry or science or engineering or whatever you do, has to spend time taking care of business. Yeah. And business 
also can have its sacred dimension. And you can learn things from fixing the plumbing that feed back into your art. Mm -hmm. Which again is why when I talked at the beginning about playing materialistic music, part of the material isn't just, you know, the wood, the wood that the instrument is made out of, it is also the material of your life and how you arrange your house and how you arrange your time and what you do, what you don't do, what limits you set. Mm -hmm. That's material too. Yeah. It, it's wonderful to use words in a completely different way. I mean, I'd, I'd read about in your book about this way of talking about materialism, with, but even when you said it this morning, I sort of yeah, recoiled, I right? <laughs> <laughs> um, before we leave the whole software thing, I was thinking about, because you wrote another program that relates to synesthesia, where yeah. music is depicted visually. And do you yourself have synesthesia? I do. I don't have strong synesthesia. Mm -hmm. um, I certainly, uh, when I was young, uh, half a century ago, I had plenty of psychedelic experiences, which um, contained a lot of synesthesia. Mm -hmm. And um, just in life, listening to sound, feeling sensations with your eyes closed, I see things, I feel things, I hear things, and we all really do. And uh, so I became very interested in visual music. I also, um, I did my PhD dissertation on William Blake, mm -hmm. who was poet, painter, philosopher, uh, very much what we to would today call an intermedia artist. And the whole idea that um, visual art is separate from music, is separate from poetry is separate from prose, is separate from theater or movies. Uh, I just, it's just quite unnecessary. Mm -hmm. And um, so for many years, I started doing uh, visual music pieces back in the 1970s, uh, at that time with slide tape pieces, where I'd have uh, two slide projectors and a dissolve unit and they were clanking and clagging at the back of the theater and uh, making a lot of noise and we would do music with it. Uh, and of course, in recent years, you can do a lot of things on the computer that are um, much more uh, subtle and interesting. Mm -hmm. And uh, I also wrote a piece of software called Visual Music Tone Painter, which allowed you to play on a MIDI keyboard and get all kinds of graphic um, sort of Pythagorean color things on the screen. We had a show at the Smithsonian in 2000. Mm -hmm. And let's talk about the intersection of theater and music in improvisation, because you're really known for that. And I believe you got to know um, Keith Johnstone. Yes, I did. Yeah, he was quite wonderful. He came by, it was around um, 1981, or two uh, to the San Francisco Zen Center where I spent a lot of time then and um, offered a workshop. And then uh, he gave some more workshops in San Francisco and I got to know him. And he was really, really fascinating person, uh, very funny, very incisive intelligence. And I've worked since then with a lot of theater improvisers and, uh, you know, once again, the lines between what I'm interested in is um, the creative process without categorizing it. So the lines between theater and music and dance are not that significant. And I've done a lot of workshops with mixed groups of musicians, actors, and dancers. And very often when musicians and dancers work, the dancers are on stage doing their thing and the musicians are in the corner making sound. But I like to work with musician, dancer, musician, dancer, musician, mm -hmm. dancer, and musicians can move and dancers can make noise. Mm -hmm. And of course they can both speak and 
do theater. So I'm really interested in these syncretic art forms that come out of, and then of course those people whose creativity has flowered in one particular skill can really shine in that skill, but it doesn't have to be so specialized. Yeah, and I was thinking that relates to your suggestion to for musicians who are highly trained to like take an instrument that's new for them. I yeah. actually took your suggestion. I went and bought a hand pan for that purpose, actually. Oh, nice. To, yeah. Those are great. Yeah. Those are great, yeah. <laughs> but I was thinking if, if people, if musicians, if we did some theater improv, it would probably help us a lot. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And one of the things... Um, People who do theater improv, I mean, very much so in the United States, um, sometimes the word improv only means theater or comedy mm -hmm. to people. Uh, or to some people, improv only means jazz. Yeah. And, you know, and so forth. And of course, it's, it's a vast universe. Um, but it's really valuable for um, theater improvisers to discover that improvisation doesn't have to be funny yeah and it's valuable for especially classically trained musicians to learn that music doesn't always have to be serious in another interview i heard you talking with um an actor i can't remember his name uh, another podcast and he was saying how a lot of uh actors they want to go for funny when they're improvising because they get an immediate reaction yeah they know yeah. But it's harder when it's serious. I thought that was very insightful. Oh, yeah, you get that sense. You know, of course, when people laugh, you hear it immediately. And, uh, of course, once again, if you're a classically trained musician and people start laughing, this is supposed to be a bad thing, but actually it doesn't have to be. And um, uh, But if you're in the theater and people laugh, you hear that immediately. And you respond to that in a feedback loop. But when people's hair stands up on the back of their necks and they experience awe or quiet joy, you don't necessarily get that instant feedback. So it's really important to cultivate a kind of bigger awareness of how people are reacting to what you mm -hmm. do. I was just wondering, you, were, you mentioned the San Francisco Zen Center. I just, because I just read uh, Deborah Madison's biography as a chef. Did you know her? Because she was. I very, I knew her very slightly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, not a musician. I was just, uh, just making that yeah. connection in my yeah. mind because she talks so much about, about that time in her life. Right. Um, so and when cooking you. Cooking is another, uh, uh, now that you mentioned the chef, mm -hmm. of course, cooking and food in general is another area like music where creativity exists on a continuum between composing and improvising and there are people who love to read and write recipes and then there's people who improvise yeah um, and i mm -hmm. yeah go ahead I was just thinking, I mean, I think cooking is the most, apart from conversation, it's the most accessible mode of improvisation for most people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, of course, my mother taught me to, well, what the, the way you learn to cook is you just taste it every once in a while, <laughs> and then you adjust. Mm -hmm. And that's actually what happens in music, too. Yeah. And... Um, where was I going with this? Oh yeah, so when you wrote Free Play, I believe Yehudi Menuhin uh, really encouraged you with yeah, this. So what was your relationship with him? Well, I, um, I was living in San Francisco Bay Area then, and he was, I, I loved his, not only his music, but his writings yeah. about music were really great. And his writings about, uh, you see, when I, um, uh, when I when I started improvising, I had I had um, quit the violin for a couple of years, and then picked it up after having studied Indian music, mm -hmm. and after having recovered from an injury, and and so I started 
learning, unlearning what I'd learned as a kid and relearning to play out of my body and learning about weight and balance and gesture and lightness and all of that stuff. And then I started finding stuff that he had written uh, and it was, I, I realized that I was really just reconstructing a lot of the things that he had discovered. And uh, so he was playing the Brahms Violin Concerto with the San Francisco Symphony. And I went backstage and uh, introduced myself and told him what I did. So uh, he said, well, that sounds interesting. Why don't you come to my hotel room tomorrow and play for me? <laughs> so I practiced a lot that day and I went to his hotel and we had about a five hour conversation. It was really extraordinary and uh, became friends. And, uh, and I saw him from time to time over the years after that. He invited me to come teach workshops at his uh, school in England. And uh, he was really, um, I wish I could have had him as a teacher, but he was, uh, he was certainly a great encourager and he really encouraged, he, 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 it was really his suggestion at which I started writing free play. Yeah, and, uh, he was very, very supportive and encouraging to the work that I was doing and wonderful person. I only met him once. He was he was quite elderly. Um, he was conducting at, at McGill where I was going to school and the presence, like the, his sense of, I don't know, just his presence was amazing. And I'd read all his books when I was a kid as well. Um, yeah. What did you play from that day when you met him? Oh, I improvised. So I was wondering. Yeah. Yeah. And I'd read, you know, you talked about you had this injury and you had to relearn. So in terms of your early training, was it just really kind of um, old school? Old school straight violin lessons. Yeah. Yeah. Were there things from that, from those early lessons that, that you have kept with you? Or did you really have to reject so much? I had to uh, mostly reject, though, interestingly enough, my teacher, uh, I, I, uh, after I had grown up and transformed my life and became the kind of artist that I am, um, I had moved back to Los Angeles for some time and uh, spent a lot of time with my childhood violin teacher, who at that point was elderly and didn't play very well, but he became a photographer and still taught and uh, still taught violin. And he really... Um, had an incredible sense of what art is. Mm -hmm. And so I think I may have even though the strictly, how do you play the violin part of the lessons was something I had to outgrow. Uh, the sense of being an artist was was there with him and, and I really appreciated that. So did you go to India to study music or was it no, in the States? No, I've never been to India. Mm -hmm. uh, I did go, I became, uh, I, I'd been interested in Indian music but before, but after, uh, after I finished grad school, I um, spent a year living in Switzerland, in the okay. French part of Switzerland, in uh, a small town called Yverdon, and uh, it was outside of Lausanne. And... Um, I happened to bump into a an Indian tabla teacher named Shashi Nayak who taught tablas in Geneva. So I ended up taking lessons from him mm -hmm. for that year and really started to learn something about the structure of Indian music. And then when I came back and was living in Berkeley, um, there was a sort of vibrant Indian music community in the Bay Area and Ali Akbar Khan had a school in San Rafael and I took lessons from him and uh, he was quite remarkable also. Were you playing um, Indianized violin or were you playing tabla? Were you singing? I was playing violin. Okay. Yeah. And for the rhythms, were you vocalizing? Yeah. When you first learned? Yeah. Yep. Din din da ge ti ti na kata kata ti ti din kata ti ti din ti ti din that's so great. Yeah. That's something. So great. Yeah. Um, so uh, 
I was thinking, you know, you wrote The Art of Is actually right before the pandemic. Yes. But it's so, I mean, I bought it early in the pandemic and took a long time reading it and making notes. Mm. And it was, it was so helpful. And mm. it was really a perfect book for the time we've been living in. One thing, yeah. I think it was in that book where you talked about no solo is solo. That's right. Because we're, we have everyone we've ever, who's influenced us and loved us and hated us. And even when you're alone with your microphone, you're not alone. And I found that very comforting. And Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I mean, it really, the art of is, in a sense, free play and the art of is, um, free play is about the creative process from the inside out. And the art of his is about the creative process from the outside in and from the sense of community and ecology and our connection to the wider world mm -hmm. and the people we're, that we share the world with. So you've been a practicing a student of Buddhism and, and a Buddhist for over 40 years, I believe. Yeah. yeah. How did you get into that world? Well, I was, uh, like a lot of things that I've learned, uh, I learned about it intellectually first and then in the body. Uh, so I'd read, uh, again, being a child of the 60s, I'd read a lot of, uh, of Buddhist and Taoist philosophy. Um, and uh, that was, that was uh, very interesting to me, but it was separate in a way. Um, and then I spent many years working with my lifetime teacher, Gregory Bateson, the anthropologist and philosopher and biologist and many other things. And um, he was English and uh, very much uh, an inheritor of the 19th century British biology tradition, but applied to pretty much everything in the world. Um, but he, he had a very strong affinity for Buddhist philosophy mm -hmm. and had a strong affinity for Buddhists. And, uh, and one day uh, I was at Gregory's house in Big Sur and there was a um, young American Zen priest there giving a little talk. And... Uh, he used the word practice. Now, I'd heard the word practice a million times in reference to Buddhist practice, to meditation and walking and everything else that we do. Um, but somehow, the, when he said it that day, it kind of hit me between the eyes be, because I realized, well, I'm a musician and I practice a lot. And it made the practice of this join with the practice of sitting still on a cushion. And what was really important was the idea that, you know, in the West, we have the idea that you practice an instrument to get better at the instrument. So it's still you, but now you have more skills on this. And the Eastern idea of practice is to affect the person, the total person. And it's really, and to the extent that you're playing an instrument or whatever you do, whatever your craft or skill is in life, uh, it's not you plus this, it's you are all, you and this are a system together. And practice means becoming comfortable being in the world that you're in and breathing. And so that was very interesting to me. That was a that was just that day when he said the word practice, it connected a lot of patterns for me. Hmm. And so I started really uh, uh, going to Zen Center and sitting a lot. And um, so that that really uh, was the basis of that was the basis that, that that's what I was sitting on when I was beginning free play. Okay. And when you're in a, like I, I do a little bit of meditation, but I've never done a group meditation. Yeah. It must be so different. It is. It's actually so much easier 
-hmm. And I'm saying this from my house in the country in Virginia, where I very, very seldom get a chance to, I sit with my wife mm -hmm. quite often, um, but there's something about sitting in a large group where it's actually much easier to maintain your stability for a long period of time just because there are other people there doing it also. Mm -hmm. And in the, the San Francisco Zen Center had three uh, places, three facilities. Uh, one was in this beautiful place in Green Gulch out in Marin County, and there was another Tassajara down in the Monterey Mountains. Uh, but the one in San Francisco was right next to the freeway. And it was right next to where, uh, you know, there were two or three freeways that were intersecting and heading at rush hour towards the uh, Bay Bridge. And um, so very often, if I was living up in Marin County and I would drive down to San Francisco to do whatever I was doing that day, and then I'd rather than drive back in rush hour, I'd go into Zen Center and just meditate with the folks there mm -hmm. at rush hour with all this noise going on. But since there were 40 of us sitting and meditating, we were completely impervious to the traffic noise, where if it was just me sitting by myself, I would have gone nuts listening to that traffic noise. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I started writing free play, I uh, was an art, at an artist colony in the Southern California mountains called Dorland Mountain Colony that was, uh, I was living in a um, tiny little cabin. Uh, there were four cabins spread out over the land about half a mile apart from each other. And there was no electricity and no phone. And uh, of course, it was long before the internet. And so we had Clivus Maltram toilets and kerosene lamps and so forth. But there was a uh, turn of the century Steinway uh, baby grand that had been bought from Rachmaninoff by the woman <laughs> who started the colony. Uh, and um, there was something wonderful about sitting and writing in your studio all by yourself, knowing that over there, someone else was sitting and writing in her studio on the other side of the hill. Mm -hmm. And over here, somebody else was painting on this side of the hill. And that sense of communal practice, even though we were all doing our own individual pro projects and just saw each other every once in a while, there was something very powerful about that. So it's, mm -hmm. I found it very similar to meditating in a group. In both your books, you quote William Blake quite a bit, and you had done your dissertation, written your dissertation yeah. on him. Yeah. Have you returned to his work over the years? And is oh it, yes, all the time. It I resonates differently. All the time. And um, sometimes I find, sometimes when I return to him, I find him tremendously boring. <laughs> and okay, well, I've seen this already. I don't need any more of that. And then a couple of years later, I return to it and it just grabs me by the throat and yanks me into another place that I need to go to. And of course, that's, it's true with pieces of music too. You know, there's some some things that you've heard a million times and you've really had enough of them for one lifetime. And then you hear it a million and one times and suddenly it changes your life. So yeah, Blake has, Blake continues to be with me. Yeah. And I did, I just recently put up on the internet for a friend, there was a piece I composed in 2001 based on Blake's illustrations of the book of Job. And um, that was, that's been seen at various museums, but uh, I just put it online for the first time. Mm -hmm. And it still feels fresh to me. And Blake still, you know, and Blake living in a time of so much turmoil and war. And, um, you know, he was one of many British uh, peaceniks, you might say, who were, um, who were not regarded well by the British government because mm -hmm. they, they, had, uh, they didn't have the internet, but they had their ways of spying on what people were doing. 
Yeah. But he had this extraordinary, um, you know, and he was he was so unknown and unrecognized in his lifetime and for many, many years after that. And uh, perhaps if he had been born in Tibet in the same century, he would have been a high lama and would have been, you know, had thousands of people paying attention to his art and his words and you know, mm -hmm. he may have been in the wrong place at the wrong time. But uh, in many ways, we're catching up to him now. When you, um, we talked about when you wrote Free Play, uh, Yehudi Menuhin had encouraged you. So when I um, picked up The Art of Is, I couldn't help but notice you have a wonderful testimonial by Yo-Yo Ma on the back. So are, is he um, someone that you had sent the manuscript to before it was published? Yes, yeah. I don't know him. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, uh, I asked if I could send the manuscript, and he did write an absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous blurb that really, he really hit it on the head. He really got it. He clearly, he clearly loved it, and um, yeah. it's wonderful to, um, like, he's a really interesting musician in, in how he's explored different yeah. elements of creativity yeah. and not just stuck to what he could have could have yes. done. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And some of the art of is, I believe, were transcribed speeches that you'd given because when you give talks, you generally are you're improvising. You're not working. That's right. Yeah. From a script. That's right. And your son, who's a poet, helped you edit the book. Yes. Yes. And my son, who's a poet, um, the first talk that I gave, that ended up in the art of is. And of course, the chapters, everything got edited together in a mm -hmm. horrible format. So, so the talks weren't uh, exact. Well, a couple of the talks, like our, the uh, chapter all about frogs, was almost exactly a talk as given. Mm -hmm. And there were a couple of others that were like that. Actually, now that I think about it, finger kissing was mm -hmm. um, several were. But um, the first talk that I gave. Um, my wife was pregnant with Jack, so this talk was 1993, and I and the book was published in 2019. And my wife was pregnant with Jack, and I had the tape of the talk in my bag as I was driving home from Monterey to Los Angeles, and uh, I said, "Well, that was not bad. Uh, you know, I should really uh, turn that into a book." And uh, I realized that I'm going to become a father in four months, so I'd better, my life is about to change totally, and I'd better get on the stick and write now. And of course, I had to wait until the baby <laughs> grew up to be a man, and a poet, and an incredibly skillful editor to really give the book its final shape. Yeah. And the title, he thought of the title. Yeah. So you talk about acting like an ancestor, and certainly yeah. with, with your books, I mean, you've, you've really done that. Um, I was really uh, so moved by the story of Herbert Zipper, and I did watch that documentary. Oh, great. Yeah, um, it's really extraordinary. Let's see, Never Give Up is the name of it. So Never for people up. who are interested, it's uh, you can rent it on Vimeo. It's wonderful now. These relatively obscure documentaries are quite yes. available. So maybe yeah. you can speak to that story. Yeah, Herbert Zipper... I was uh, introduced uh, to Herbert. Uh, I was living in the Pacific Palisades neighborhood of Los Angeles then, and it was just a few blocks away from Herbert. It was a very interesting neighborhood. I mean, we had, you know, among the people, not we, but among the people who had lived in that neighborhood in the past included both Stravinsky and Schoenberg and Thomas Mann and Bertolt Brecht and you know, a whole bu Henry Miller, a whole bunch of very interesting people had lived there mostly in the 40s. Um, so a very dear friend of mine, Larry Livingston, conductor, um, called me up one day and said, you've got to meet my friend Herbert, who lives near you. And we went over there. And uh, Herbert was in his 90s then. He was fairly close to death. Um, he had been a conductor and composer, born in Vienna in 1904, and um, 
if history had turned out differently, he might have been like Bruno Walter, or, you know, one of those big mid-century conductors. Um, but instead, uh, Hitler took power, and the Anschluss came, and they marched into Vienna, and they threw him into Dachau. And um, he, on his third day of slave labor there, he, for some reason, started reciting some lines of Goethe. And he noticed that other prisoners who were not well-read or cultured people uh, heard this and stood up a little straighter and got a gleam in their eyes and reacted to this poetry. And he got the idea of starting a clandestine orchestra. He found a bunch of musicians who were prisoners in the camp. And um, he started writing pieces. They were not extraordinary pieces. They were just songs. Um, and they performed them in the latrines. And they'd have uh, sentries posted to see if the SS sentries were coming so that they could scatter. And he wrote some songs that jumped from camp to camp. And he did what needed to be done in that place. And it, this was actually before the war started. It was yeah. just before the war started. And his father had escaped to London and had some money and managed to bribe him out of there. So he gets out of there. He was in Dachau, then Buchenwald, and then makes it to London. And then he gets a job offer to become conductor of the Manila Philharmonic. So he goes, you know, oh goody, the Philippines, that's as far away from Nazi Germany as you can possibly get. So he went to the Philippines and then almost immediately the Japanese invaded. And once again, he was in the same boat. You know, he was a prisoner of war. Um, he got the musicians to bury their instruments and in farmland in the countryside and so forth and um, made it through the war alive. And uh, when um, Manila was liberated uh, in really terrible, gruesome battles, uh, he got MacArthur to organize the musicians to come back together, the third of them who were left alive and performed the New World Symphony and the Eroica Symphony. And then he came to the United States and he was one of the people who started the artists in the schools programs that we have now. And uh, he actually, in his old age, he was in, he was leading youth orchestras all over the place, preferably in places that didn't have them and that didn't have access to so-called high culture. And uh, he was in Tiananmen Square when that happened in 1991. And uh, everybody in the hotel left China immediately and he wanted to stay so he could see what was going on. And he was 89 years old then. So he was quite a remarkable person. And he was somebody who stood up for his entire life for the power of the arts to liberate people. The power of the arts to, you know, the arts are not going to uh, free Ukraine. They aren't going to free Tibet, but they are going to make people sit up and be more human and persevere and realize what it is that they're trying to do here on Earth. Yeah, and in that, um, in this little documentary, uh, Never Give Up, this kid asks him, um, how do you read music? And I think his answer was something like, um, anything, even if it's difficult, anything you wanna learn, you can learn, if, if yeah. you really wanna do it. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, it was amazing you, you got to, to get to know him. Uh, yeah. Um, I wanted to talk about uh, parameters in, in improvisation. Nice. 
So we can't have too many, but it's helpful to have some. Right. Well, there's all kinds of views. There's as many views on parameters as there are improvisers. And, um, and if for that matter, just let, let's just talk about parameters in music. Mm -hmm. Because on the one hand, you have the completely composed score where everything is set and the performer has the skill of transcribing that score into sound. But still, we enjoy the performance when the performer puts herself into it and makes it an individual act. So there's some improvisation there. And at the other end of what you might call extreme improvisation, that is, people having no parameters and just getting up and making noise, they still, even if they don't intend to, are still listening to each other and still affected by their environment. So to some degree that totally free, I'm thinking of what, what's called free jazz. So free jazz is still structured and totally scored classical music is still free. And right in the middle, you have certain traditional forms like jazz, like Indian classical music, which are, um, you might say, half and half. They have certain patterns and structures that have been passed down from person to person for years, decades, or centuries. And within those patterns or around those patterns, people are improvising and putting their own voice into it and discovering new things. And uh, we enjoy those performances probably in equal degree by how much they're playing the tune and by how, that we recognize and how much they're creating something brand new. And then there's the people, I guess, sort of, I guess I'm sort of in this camp of people who um, are not playing with external parameters at all, but are playing with some internal parameters and discovering patterns. You know, you begin to make a sound and you have no intention before you make the sound. But now that you've made that sound, that sound sculpts the environment that you're in. And so now the second sound is played within that first environment. And now the relationship between the two sounds is placed within that environment. And meanwhile, you have the room and the feel of the place and your breath and the breath of the people and how the floor feels on your feet and gradually you discover that there's an enormous amount of structure and you're uncovering that structure as you play. Something I ask a lot of improvising musicians is if they're hearing what they're about to play before they play it. Mm. And I find it's, it's not everybody. People have different ways of working. How about yourself? Uh, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. I usually don't, mm -hmm. but I do sometimes. Yeah. And I really, um, I don't particularly, you know, sometimes people get together and say, well, let's play, uh, uh, we need some structure, so let's play in D minor and in 4-4 four, four time or something like that. So I'm not one of those people. I'm not interested in those types of structures at all. Yeah. But what I am interested in is the structure that's formed when people are paying attention to each other. Well, on that note, do you want to take a music break? Do you want to play some Why music? not? <laughs> What's to stop us? Yeah. I might just have to adjust my mic. Okay. Well, I'll play on this thing. It's coming out of the uh, speakers, but I think the level will be okay for... Yeah, you know, I'll play and you'll let me know 
yeah. if it's too hot. Yeah. So I have a regular acoustic violin. Is that too loud? I can turn it. Well, before we start improvising, I just want to make sure the sound's not going to be. Is that yes, too loud? I know, but making sure that the sound is good. Yeah. It sounds great to me, but making sure the sound is good means you're already improvising. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm, a, <laughs> I'm a podcaster, so I have to make sure it's not distorted. I'm just going to turn this down a bit. My phone is ringing over there, so I have to play with that too. <laughs> Wonderful. That was fun.
Ayama yelo, ome ome hala ya noa. Eya ayama lawe ho, ome hone ho le ya noa. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Love the water phone. I played one with Jesse Stewart a few episodes oh, ago. Oh, cool. Do you know him? No, I don't. I mean, I know who he is, but I don't yeah, know. Yeah, you should yeah. meet him. It was interesting because with him, we were talking about how when he went to university, he was studying both visual art and music at the same time. And yeah. his art professors were very supportive, but his music professors, yeah. not so much. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um. So I was just thinking, I know there's always more things I wanted to ask about. Um, we talked, you know, one thing we didn't discuss that I'd love to discuss with you a little bit is somatic awareness. I believe you've studied uh, Alexander Technique and maybe Feldenkrais. I didn't really study them. Okay. But I, I know something about them. I mean, I have friends who are real practitioners. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, I think they're, um, I mean, any kind of somatic awareness is so important, you know, because otherwise, if you play an instrument here, you'll just be like crumpled up like a piece of cardboard in about five minutes, unless you're, unless you're really aware of how you're breathing and how you're moving and balance and weight. And, you know, the interesting thing about a violin bow is that um, the average violin bow weighs 60 grams. So you need 60.00001 grams of force to keep it from falling to the ground. And that's not very, that's not very much. So I'm just curious, it's on the string though. I mean, the weight of the bow is being held. No, I'm right. saying I'm just holding the, okay. holding the bow in the air. Okay. Okay, holding the bow in the air just like this yeah. requires 60.001. Mm -hmm. Now, when the bow is on the string, of course, you don't need anything, or you might need a gram or two. And so you're talking about very tiny amounts of force. And very tiny movements or sometimes very big movements but they are, you know, to learn to become conscious of how you're moving and what you're moving, to learn to become conscious of pain as a message about how you're moving and where you're moving and to allow yourself to adjust is really very precious. 
Um, I was, uh, when I was learning to become an improviser, I was also around a lot of dancers. Mm -hmm. And I learned an awful lot from them. Yeah, I was going to ask you, actually. I mean, it was it partly your meditation practice that's helped you with that awareness? Well, partly meditation practice, but also I was around a lot of dancers. Okay. And a lot of, and the first, um, the first concerts that I gave as an improviser, I rented dance studios and often did duos or trios with dancers and learned to move myself. And, and um, so all these things, you know, the, the bow, the violin, whatever instrument you're playing, whatever weight you're carrying, uh, you can learn to carry it very lightly with very, very little effort. And when you experience effort or when you experience pain, that's great because those are messages about what you can let go of. Yeah. And you can often do, um, you can do so much with less. And that applies to sound also. You know, when people are improvising together and they want uh, feedback from me, 90% of what I have to say is play less. <laughs> because there's so much information there. You know, there's so much information in your neck. There's so much information in your hips. There's so much information in the sound that your partner is sending to you and you can process that information at your leisure. You can act as though you have all the time and all the space in the world. And a, developing a sense of ease, I think applies yeah. to people in daily life, whether they're musicians yeah. or... Yeah. In, I think it was in The Art of Is that you talked, you had a beautiful image of just dialing up or down in terms of your yeah. your receptivity. Yeah. I love that. Yes, um, yes. Certainly as a performer, when we get very nervous, our focus can get too narrow. And it's so, yeah. so important to have that broader yeah. awareness. I'm always reminding myself of that. Yeah. And when you're in a performance context, you're often concerned about impressing people. And that adds a whole uh, factor of tension into your body. Yeah. And so you just learn to spot that and dial it down. And I mean, everybody is, you know, you want to give the people, uh, if you're a performer, you want to give the people their money's worth. Uh, if you're a kid in school, you want to do well, whatever do well means. If you're a teacher, you want to give the kids something that gives them something, you know. Uh, but um, to be able to be silent sometimes and to sit back and do nothing can be so powerful. I believe and you it. might find in the space of a five minute piece that there's a hundred places where you can do nothing. And there's still plenty of information in that piece. And if you're giving a talk to people, there are so many places where you can just say nothing. And yet there's a still a tremendous amount of information that's going on. I just wanted to interject. I think it was maybe in your first book, Free Play, that you talk about the Buddhist, um, uh, you know, the, the judge, the judge, you know, the different the ways. The judging specter. Yes, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. I mean, we have that... Uh, so much, I mean, more so now than when I wrote Free Play in the 1980s, because our society has become completely insane over assessment. 
and students are assessed and students are expected to assess their teachers and the schools are assessed and performers are assessed and people are assessed in their jobs and there are so many surveys and uh, people can be driven completely insane by trying to um, live up to other people's judgments, let alone living up to your own judgments. And so it does become a kind of boogeyman in your head. And to get rid of that boogeyman, you know, you have, it's, like, it's like walking through, I was, when you, I, I, I just thought of that image in The Lord of the Rings, where, you know, Frodo and Sam are walking through Shelob's lair and there's like all these, all these uh, spider webs, you know, giant spider webs and you're having to like, you know, uh, I mean, we walk through society, you spend 15 minutes on the internet and how many pop-ups come up asking you to assess something and how many things pop up asking for your attention when all you want to read is an article. Uh, so we become obsessed with assessment and we have to just ignore it. And sometimes if we're in a job situation, we have to render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, but then get off of it as soon as you can. I was reading um, a neurologist, anyway, she was writing about the fact that 50% of our brain is taken up with our visual cortex. Mm. And I was wondering, since you're not playing for music, uh, sheet music anymore, yeah, yeah, it must really change things because I'm an orchestral musician. It's so visual, right. you know, the conductor right. and everything. It can really get right. in the way. Right. It's true. It is very visual, and uh, yeah, I think that I, I think that's for me. It's really great to not, and and I'm certainly um, influenced or inspired. Uh, I mean, I remember when I was speaking to Menuhin one time, you know, talking about visual art, and he said, oh, so it inspires you, you know, meaning this is, this is the score, you know, and the rectangle of the computer that I have in front of me as we talk is a score of a kind, and the trees outdoor the oaks and the poplars are a score. So there's lots of scores besides the notation, but it is really wonderful in, for me personally. And I have, I have extraordinary admiration for my friends who are musicians who play scores and do it far more beautifully than I ever could. Um, but I'm thinking, you know, you were talking about, um, if I could swivel to the side here, uh, when we were talking about the body, there's, I don't know if I can even do it, but there's like pianist's neck, mm -hmm. you know, where you see pianists, you know, where the, the music is here, they're relating to that, to the, uh, to the keyboard underneath, uh, but the head has to be up to see the score, and you see this absolutely uh, wonderfully wiggling body at the shoulders, but meanwhile the head is like tilted up, and it just seems very painful to me. And yet people do it year after year and they do beautifully. So maybe it's fine, <laughs> but I, find, I would find it very uncomfortable. I was thinking what you said about the trees outside are part of the score. You've done a couple of recordings recently where you use beautiful field recordings that are integrated. Oh yes, thank you. Yeah, I mean, the, the, um, I've actually been in isolation for three years now because pretty much the minute The Art of Is came out and I was about to start doing trips and gigs, um, I discovered that I had a bunch of heart problems. Mm. I had an aneurysm and valve, all, all kinds of bad stuff. And I ended up having open heart surgery, which fortunately turned out completely fine. Um, but uh, I wanted to give myself six more months after that to really get my energy back and be able to travel and do gigs again. So that would have put me at March of 2020. <laughs> so I've been here, and fortunately, um, 
I have a home. It's a nice home in the country. Uh, I'm very much aware of people who don't have those things and uh, uh, have had to deal with the pandemic, whereas it's been fairly easy for me. So what I'd been doing for um, getting out into the world was just getting out on the trails in the forest here and recording birds. I became really intensely aware of bird song. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of like what I said before about um, practice, when the Buddhist priest said the word practice. It's like I was aware of bird song, obviously, for my whole life before, and I was always interested in biology, but somehow it hit me between the eyes, and I really, really got into bird song. And I discovered that I could uh, record the thrushes out there and bring it into the studio in the computer. You can slow it down and drop it three or four octaves. And it sounds a great deal like whale song. And there's all kinds of interesting things going on there. And so I did an album of music, violin, viola, electric violin, plus birds, plus eight or ten species of birds that live right outdoors here, and that was called Hermitage of Thrushes. And then I teamed up with a good friend of mine, David Rothenberg, who is a um, clarinetist and multi-instrumentalist and improviser, but who's also spent years improvising with birds, with whales, with insects, with all kinds of creatures. So we did a remote album together over the internet, um, much as you and I are hanging out today. And um, then I started doing things with other people. So, so the, uh, um, the whole pandemic period has actually been really fruitful for me. I've been very fortunate. I've had three albums of new music come out and a fourth one is about to come out with another friend, a flutist, Ellen Burr, whom I'd played with for many years. And, um, and then another flutist, the album came out at the end of last year, um, Anders Hagberg from Sweden. So we were able to record remotely between Charlottesville, Virginia and Gothenburg, Sweden. And that turned out really well. Um, so the connection with nature and the connection with other people, even through this weird electronic medium that we find ourselves in is very interesting. Uh, and now that I'm about to start traveling again and doing things in the so-called real world, uh, I'm so aware of how much my practice has changed through this connection with birds and the connection with remote people and the kinds of dialogues that I've been able to have that I would simply never have had if I weren't, um, if it weren't for the pandemic and if it weren't for us getting comfortable hanging out with each other over long distances electronically. So these recordings you made, were they done in this way, so out of sync, or were they done, like you make a recording, then the person reacts to that? No, no, they were, they were, we'd play together on Zoom. Yeah. And of course, the sound of Zoom is crappy, but uh, we would each have, on each of our sides, we would be simultaneously recording with good equipment. Uh, and then we'd bring the recordings back into the studio here. So we'd have your side and my side and the Zoom video. Mm -hmm. And you use the Zoom video to synchronize the other two and then throw away the sound from the Zoom. Yeah. And now you have a um, nice quality studio recording. And in some ways, it's almost better than recording live because if you and I are playing together and I make a blooper, whatever that means in the context of improv, uh, we just have to cut that part of the music out. Whereas in this context, it's almost like the way music is recorded in in the pop music world in studios with separate tracks uh, so that if I make a blooper I can just dip my sound down while yours keeps going mm -hmm. 
so the flow of the music continues all the way through and then you can do little editing things like you know then you can do editing things like taking parts of of one of us and doubling it and putting it in another place in the track and starting to build up more multi-layered voices mm -hmm. and so of course when you start editing in the studio in that way that starts blurring the line between composition and improvisation. Yeah. We were talking about the internet, and of course this is one of the beautiful things about the internet. Yeah. Um, but we got away, actually I did want to circle back to the this Buddhist idea of the judgment specter, because we, uh, I didn't really get you to speak to that. Ah, uh, the big boogeyman in the head <laughs> who, who, cow, who, who hovers over you and tells you that it's not good enough, that you're not good enough, that you'll never be as good as so-and-so, that no matter how many years you practice, you'll never be as good as so-and-so, that, oops, you made a mistake. Isn't that terrible that you made a mistake? So I have this chapter in The Art of Is called Finger Kissing, which is the antidote to the boogeyman. And that comes from, um, there was this guy named Johann van Beethoven, whose little boy, Ludwig van Beethoven, was a talented little pianist. And uh, the father was um, mindful of the example of Mozart uh, running around to the crowned heads of the world and entertaining them as a little kid. And he figured that little Ludwig van Beethoven would be the goose that laid the golden egg for his family. And so uh, the father would stand over the son and whack him on the fingers with a big stick every time he made a mistake. So one day I was teaching a workshop at Juilliard where these students were far better musicians than I will ever be and uh, many of them had never improvised before and they did absolutely gorgeous pieces and then there was one that was like out of sync and weren't really listening to each other and they were looking dejected and glum and i could tell that johann van beethoven was in the room whacking them on the fingers oh my god you made a mistake you weren't perfect and so i told them to go around and start walk around the room and start kissing their fingers. So finger kissing is great. It's an antidote to the judging specter. Because believe me, we have we all have that specter roaming around inside. And of course, there's the in the in our world of assessment and judgment that is present in schools and in the arts and in business and just about everywhere in life. The specters are inside and outside. There's nothing wrong with trying to do something, seeing something you did and trying to do it a little better or adjusting it, you know, adjusting your angle or adjusting the weight or something. Oh, I could, I could, I didn't like the way that sounded, so I can try it this way now. And now I could try it this way, and now I could try it this way. You know, that's that kind of judgment is okay. But the kind of judgment that is about uh, you're no damn good and you'll never make it, and there's only one right way to do it. And look at the masters who have come before you. I mean, there was poor Brahms who waited 20 years to write his first symphony because Beethoven was sitting on his shoulders. How could I ever equal that guy? Yeah, I've sometimes wondered if Brahms wasn't so neurotic, how much more music we would have had from him. Yes, indeed, indeed, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it was thanks to a really boring I never I, I was originally thinking of putting it in the book but it's going to have to go somewhere else um, my encounter with Jesus Christ 
thanks to Brahms. Mm -hmm. So I was involved in a music festival where the um, concerts took place in a Catholic church. And so we, the audience, at one point I was watching a concert and there were six really top of the line, wonderful musicians playing a Brahms sextet. And they were so competent and so terrific and it was so boring because they were just phoning it in and it was it, it just, you know, but I was like crowded into these pews, you know, these hard pews with a bunch of other people and I certainly couldn't move or, you know, God forbid, leave. Um, so I just kind of went into his trance and I looked behind the musicians there was a huge life-size crucifix. And it was one of these Spanish-style crucifixes, you know, with the crown of thorns and the wound in his side and the blood dripping everywhere and this gruesome, you know, long, pained face that was, like, tilted down like this. And I was looking at him, and suddenly he lifted his head up and he looked right at me and he said, don't be an asshole. <laughs> and then he put his head down again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Stephen, I wanted to ask you about, <laughs> about John Cage. Okay. You knew him because, you know, I'm, um, I'm playing a lot of new music and, and it's often it's, it sounds random, but it's so carefully notated. Yes. And I, it's such a relief for me when the composer writes, especially in orchestral music, approximate pitches play out of out of phase with your neighbors. And I'm like, phew, right. we can just improvise for a few minutes That's and not right. worry about That's this. Right. Incredibly. Yeah. But you said that John Cage didn't like improvisation. He did not like it. Right. I mean, it's so weird. He was a person of so many contradictions mm -hmm. because he his ideas inspired so many musicians and other kinds of artists who were into improvisation and all different kinds of creative expression. Mm -hmm. And uh, so many of us um, owe him a huge debt of gratitude. But at the same time, he liked to control the situation and uh, I remember he had some interview about um, there's actually a wonderful uh, you can find it online there's a wonderful series of five close to an hour radio broadcasts that Cage and Morton Feldman did together in the 60s mm -hmm absolutely wonderful and it was in one of those broadcasts where cage was complaining about the new york philharmonic like leonard bernstein had invited cage to do something with the new york philharmonic and um they were given one of these sets of scores or instructions that had to do with approximate pitch and range and were given a lot of freedom within the parameters that were set. And um, he said something to Feldman about how they they just didn't like to do what they were, they just didn't want to do what they were obliged to do, which was a strange word, you know, because it's like, uh, you are obliged to be free. <laughs> you, be, you know, it's like at the beginning of free play, I talk about the ultimate double bind, which is somebody pointing at you and saying, be spontaneous, right? You know, so they were obliged to be free. So they had to be free, but in the way that he was prescribing. But he was in a position to really inspire people to really be free. Uh, and he he um, he was very um, 
he was contemptuous of Beethoven, and uh, he was particularly contemptuous of Beethoven because, of course, there's, there was the kind of cult of Beethoven in the classical music world. But the whole notion that uh, that people were in kind of a, in a jail of what they were obliged to d perform and obliged to like. Um, and yet he was also aspiring to be a composer in that vein. So it's there was a lot there's a lot of contradictions there. And uh, you know, I said to him, uh, so he said to me something about, well, he's very suspicious about improvisation and he doesn't really like it. And I said, um, well, you know, he was also a very avid and accomplished mycologist. I was going to bring that up. And he, um, and I asked him, well, you know, John, when you go in the woods hunting for mushrooms and you decide which ones to eat and which ones not to eat, do you um, throw the I Ching or toss coins or do you use your feeling and knowledge of mushrooms? So he just gave me this big seraphic smile and that was <laughs> that was his answer because he he didn't like improvisation because you um, it was based on because improvisation is based on feeling and impulse. Yeah. And I wonder to some extent, um, I mean, he was a person who was such a breakthrough artist. He was gay at a time when this was illegal, yeah. uh, possibly, you know, his mentor, uh, one of his mentors, Henry Cowell, who was a extraordinary, um, prolific composer, and teacher of composers in the 20th century, uh, Henry Kahl was put in jail for several years for being gay and never really recovered from that. And I just, I'm just speculating now. I just don't know. And I, I never knew John well enough to ask him. And I wouldn't even have think, I wouldn't have had this thought back in the 80s when I was talking to him. But uh, I just wonder if the whole notion of expressing emotion openly and in public was um, something he wanted to avoid because it was dangerous. That makes a and lot of so, sense. Yeah. Oh, so sad. Yeah. Actually, I was the mushroom thing was actually a much lighter thing. It's just because you tell that story in your book about why he got into mycology, which I thought. Oh, yes. <laughs> so he got into mycology because, I mean, there, he, he, was a, he was on the level of many university biologists and had an extraordinary collection of mushrooms. And he got into mycology because as a undergraduate student at Pomona College, uh, his... Uh, a professor said, "Hey John, you know you're so focused on music. You should uh, you should broaden your interests." And so, already being John Cage, he uh, got out a dictionary and looked up the word music, and looked right above it and saw the word mushroom. And he said, "Okay, I'll learn about that." And he really <laughs> devoted the rest of his life to really, really learning about mushrooms, you know. And I, I, I mean, he was just fascinating, fascinating person. So many contradictions and um, perhaps the amount of his contradictions was in fact one of the things that inspired so many people through his work to do their own work you know, to inspire people to do work that doesn't look anything like his work at all, but somehow they feel they have the license to do it mm -hmm. because he did his work. Yeah, it's interesting in terms of creativity and curiosity, you know, that story about mycology, because it was like a random thing, like his music, he was into randomness, you know, yeah. his parameters. But yes, you just pick something and you go into it deeply enough, it becomes fascinating. That's right. 
Yeah. That, and, uh, yeah, he had a, he had a statement uh, that he repeated many times that if if you find something boring for two minutes, try it for four minutes, and if it's boring for four minutes, try it for eight minutes, and then sixteen, and eventually you'll find that it's quite interesting. Mm -hmm. And you know the other thing that was inspiring about him was uh, he took. Um, I think he just audited a class with Schoenberg and, uh, when he was young in L.A. And uh, Schoenberg told him, you know, look, you're never going to be a composer because you just, you just don't have a grasp of harmony and music theory and all that stuff. And so John just said, well, screw you. I'm going to, I'm really going to, I mean, he didn't say it to Schoenberg, but it's like, okay, if he, if Schoenberg says that to me, then I'm going to be a composer. <laughs> and he was, you know, and he busted so many boundaries. And um, I can certainly identify with that because my identification with uh, Western harmony is so minimal. Mm -hmm. But um, to be told that you can't do something because you don't fit the mold is a very, very powerful thing. I mean, my wife is a physician, and she was, uh, when she was uh, applying to schools, um, that was still in the day when there were very few women in medical schools. And she was, she was told in an interview, well, uh, are you sure you want to do this and give up having a family? And, you know, so her response was basically, well, screw you. I'm really going to be a doctor now. Yeah. She works in palliative care, am I right? That's right. Yeah. And you're, you're like, she's Buddhist as well? She's Buddhist as well. Boy, you've really been doing your research. This I... is an amazing interview. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So yeah, she, yeah, go, yeah, she, yeah, she works in palliative care, and uh, she's a professor here at the University of Virginia in the medical school, and and we met through um, Buddhist practice. The Dalai Lama did a series of teachings called the Kala Chakra mm -hmm. Initiation in L.A. in 1989, and that's where we met. Oh wow! I was thinking because you had this very scary episode with your open heart surgery recently, yeah. and how. But she must have a, a different perspective than most wives in, in terms of working with people at the end of life and having that, that Buddhist yeah. grounding. Yeah. Well, she also had her swords out in the hospital, you know, making sure that things happened right. Mm -hmm. all, all the <laughs> and, angles. Yes, from all the angles. And uh, I mean, it was really extraordinary to go through that experience with her. And there she was like sleeping on the window ledge night after night. <sighs> when I was in the hospital room and you know, she's just an extraordinary human being. Does she play music at all? No. Uh, however, she has extraordinary expertise in rock and roll and punk and mm -hmm. Did you... as well as comic books. She has extraordinary expertise in rock and roll, science fiction, comic books, Buddhist philosophy, and she's a fifth degree black belt in Taekwondo. Wonderful. One of my other um, guests was a uh, conductor, Daniel Bartholomew Poyser, and I was asking him about advice for conductors. And he said, go down your rabbit holes, like follow your interests and you never know where they're yeah. gonna take you. Yeah, that's great. And I'd love to end these conversations with similar questions. And I'll ask, I'll get, I'm wondering, would you have any advice for the younger Stephen Nachmanovich or do you have advice for people finding their way, trying to bust out of boundaries that they feel are being imposed on them? Yes, I'd say, well, I agree, go down your rabbit holes, but also find the other people who are going down their rabbit holes that might be a little bit different from yours. Mm -hmm but you can help each other and you can find each other and support each other. And that's really important because there's so much in our world that is um, working to split people apart. And it's great when we can find each other and assist each other in those rabbit holes. And 
keep culture alive, keep the things alive that are being decimated, and new things will flower. It's going to be a very, very um, difficult century coming up, and we need all the creativity we can get. We do. Thank you so much for your wise words and your generosity today. It was just an honor to meet you. Thank you so much. My pleasure. My life is so enriched by getting to know these incredibly inspiring creative guests and their perspectives on their lives and music. Please follow this podcast and sign up for my podcast newsletter to get sneak peeks for upcoming guests and find out about newly published transcripts.